The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Now, David, you're joining us from Brussels, Belgium. You've been in Europe through this really tumultuous time over the last few days. Do you have any comments on the fundamentals? Have the fundamentals in the market changed based on what you're seeing there? No, I think, in fact, Kevin, what you see is a reinforcement of all the things that have been in place really for some time now. I remember doing a radio program with CNBC this would go back about six, eight weeks ago. Right. And they said, well, tell us, what is this about recession? And why would anyone be concerned about recession? As the weeks have gone by, Kevin, here we are with the world reconnected with the idea that risk does abound, that the financial solutions that have been offered by the ECB and the politicians here in Europe for the European crisis have gained no traction. In fact, there's nothing really practical in play at all. You know, David, I'm thinking of contrasting that interview that you did a few weeks ago when they didn't think recession was an issue with the nervous interview of Bloomberg with you on Friday when you were in London. I mean, can you give a just the listener who didn't see that on Bloomberg an, an idea of what you were saying? Because the nervousness was high at that time. Well, and I think the issue is really this, Kevin. It's, in my opinion, a misappraisal. Uh, at this point in time, the market is looking at current events and saying clearly we need to be taking liquidity into account and preparing for something like 2008. Let's get our ducks in a row. Let's get into the most liquid positions possible. What they should be looking at, Kevin, is not just liquidity, but solvency as well. And the underlying stability of the instruments they're choosing is, I think, fatally flawed. One of the things that we've seen in the past, David, you and I have talked about this, when the world gets scared, They try to go liquid, and when they try to go liquid, the first thing that they try to do is get dollars. And what we saw last week was an unusual sign of people fearful of a system or a solvency crisis, yet they were moving into one of the very items that they thought was ultimately going to be an issue. And gold sold off. Uh, Why don't you comment on the liquidation of gold last week, David, and explain to the listener who hasn't seen this type of rush to liquidity before what was actually occurring. Well, I think one of the things that you should keep in mind is, and this this is borrowing from John Exeter, who was head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York back in the 1950s and was Mm -hmm. very adamant about the role of gold in the money system, that it should be there. John Exeter had what he called the inverted liquidity pyramid. And in very different than today's appraisal, and I must say that today's appraisal by the average investor is, is a very trained behavior to think in terms of both the dollar and treasuries as the ultimate source of liquidity. But he actually has cash and dollars as, as a less liquid item than gold. It's interesting. It's an interesting perspective from a Federal Reserve Bank president. Anybody who wants to look at that can Google it, John Exeter, inverted liquidity triangle or, or pyramid, and, and, and get an idea of what he considered sort of the packing order, if you will. What exactly was uh, the most not only stable but liquid asset on the planet? And for this Federal Reserve Bank president, it was gold, not dollars. Yeah, you know, I remember seeing that pyramid presented, oh, 25 years ago, David, and I remember, you know, of course, municipal bonds and government bonds and stocks all at the top, quite illiquid when you have a crisis. And as it worked its way down through, I sort of think of it as a liquidity funnel, you know, where money can actually flow through and, and continue. But he then shows treasuries and then and then cash. And then you're right, the most liquid item, the first one to be sold when there's a real need for liquidity, strangely enough, is gold. That's, of course, repurchased when things start to settle down a little bit. David, we know that large hedge funds have pretty strong positions in gold and have had pretty strong positions in gold, as well as having a lot of stocks and other things. They were pretty much fully invested. But there is a rumor that those large hedge funds were going to gold and selling that off first. Is that rumor true? Well, 
let's look at that because I think there's some interesting observations there. I mean, before we do, just to reiterate, the fundamentals have not changed. In fact, if you wanted to view them as being changed, you would just have to say that they've gotten stronger. You've got government spending. You've got bailout liquidity provided on both sides of the pond. You've got monetization of financial instruments, both here in Europe, where I am today, as well as in the United States. Uh, there are really no solutions which have been crafted by bureaucratic socialists in the United States or here in Europe. And at the same time, you have artificially suppressed interest rates driving real yields for investors into negative territory. So, right. yeah, I mean, we, we have a sell-off in the last few days, uh, in this last week, and the sell-off is rumored to be a large fund holdings implicated in the CME's change in margin requirements, which is effective as of the close of Monday. Why don't you go ahead and elaborate on that change, David? Well, this is something that applies for a speculative player. It applies to someone who is playing with paper gold, probably the most loose form, if you will, of paper gold, wherein you're buying a futures contract, a contract to take future delivery of X number of ounces of gold or silver. Then you can do that on a highly leveraged basis, Kevin. I mean, this is a world where three, four, five times leverage is common, if not more. And so what you have is the CME trying to moderate and control the amount of speculative juices that are in a particular market. You know, I mean, they're responsible not only for the precious metals, but for orange juice contracts and copper contracts. And all of these things, Kevin, are under their purview and scrutiny. So what they chose to do last Friday was increase the amount of money that you had to have on the table by 21% for the gold contract and by 16% for the silver contract. So if, if you owned those contracts or had some money down, they basically said, now you've got to put that much more money down if you want to keep those assets still in play. And David, it should be pointed out that this is not the actual sell of physical gold. You know, you're in Europe right now. One of the places that the company buys its gold is in Europe, and you found that to be quite tight. What we're talking about is paper gold contracts. These are not the common person who's hedging for the future. These are traders. Yeah, Kevin, I've, I've made calls and contacts and, and made efforts to buy a good degree of gold while here, Kevin, and, and that's from Zurich, that's from London, that's from continental Europe as well right here in the EU. And, you know, we're looking at premiums on very common products, you know, in London trying to buy kilo bars and finding the cost to be 6 and 7% over the spot price. That may not sound like a tremendous amount, but for a kilo bar, which is very commonly found and very accessible the world over, I found it to be a little bit out of line. And, you know, the same is true in Zurich and on and off here in, in Paris and Brussels and, and what have you, wherein the man on the street, the man on the street is, is taking an appraisal and he's, he's looking at things very differently than your average investor stateside. There, he's not moving to treasuries. He's moving to gold. He's moving to gold primarily. And so very little is available without paying pretty significant premiums. And it's the smaller the item, the higher the premium, because that's what's accessible to every man. And David, with that in mind, too, when we were talking about gold falling last week, yet you can't find it while you're in Europe or you're having to pay premiums for it. I think that takes us back to these large hedge funds. They were f almost fully invested funds, very little cash. Is the approach of the end of the third quarter affecting the price of gold right now? I mean, is that part of the rush to liquidity? Yeah, I think I think you've got a couple things going on with that, Kevin. The market by the end of last week was faced with a very ugly choice. If you were a hedge fund manager or an asset manager of any sort, you're coming into the end of the third quarter, and your numbers are either going to look pretty bad or pretty good, depending on the kind of profits that you can book before the end of the quarter. Mm -hmm. If you're already taking losses on your equities, you may have liquidated those at losses, but anything that you have that has gains, you want to go ahead and book those gains, Kevin. And I think that's what you had in addition to the CME changes, which it's very interesting, Kevin. The sell-off began in earnest well before the CME announcement on Friday, right. which, which certainly implies that there's plenty of people at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange who have loose lips and they're not sinking their own ships. In fact, I think in, under normal market conditions, you would look at that and say that's got to be illegal activity. You're operating on the basis of inside information and pre-released data. So 
yeah, the, the sell-off in the metals began before the CME announcement, as if someone knew. And that carried through Monday. That was just in time for firms to alter their books and eliminate leverage if needed to get in line with those increases. Uh, again, 21% for gold, 16% for silver. That's your main reason for sell-off. And notice, you know, in subsequent days, the, the market rebounded smartly. In fact, I look at silver, for instance, at a low of $26, uh, rebounding to over 32 Right. Very interesting volatility, par for the course for a mega bull market to be expected. I wouldn't be afraid of it, but certainly get wrenching at the same time to within, you know, a 24-hour period see that kind of a swing, both on the downside and then again on the upside in terms of recovery. But I I think what it argues for, Kevin, is essentially the fundamentals have not changed. You're looking at more than a technical glitch, but a change in the rules as they apply to the paper trade, not the physical markets, but the paper trade, and a knee-jerk reaction to that. The markets have now found their their saner selves again. Well, you know, the long-term prospects for the dollar had been downgraded by Standard & Poor's just a few weeks ago, and yet it looked like it was playing a safe haven role, that and the treasuries playing a safe haven role. Is the dollar a safe haven right now, and are the treasuries a safe haven? Is that a correct way to perceive this, especially in in light of what's going on in Europe? Kevin, the, the dollar is weak, all things considered. I think treasuries are being really the safe haven of choice, and they've been the safe haven for just about everyone. Mm-hmm. The dollar and treasuries, as you say, have been seen as a safe haven, but I would prefer to categorize them slightly differently today, not as a safe haven, but as a liquidity haven. And the preferences for treasuries, the preferences for treasuries, even over dollar-denominated cash. Well, what would you say the difference is between a safe haven investment and a liquidity haven investment? I mean, one, safe haven would probably be a longer time or a longer time frame to hold. A liquidity haven, that's pretty rapid, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. When you're looking at a liquidity haven, it's just the choice of where can I go today and leave tomorrow? Whereas a safe haven, it really is, you know, where's my port in the storm? Uh, it's probably a slightly longer-term commitment, and it's concerned with, with more than just being readily available. So yeah, something like gold would be a safe haven, dollars and treasuries more of a liquidity haven, and they're serving that purpose well at this point, but there is a difference between the two. In my opinion, the market is misjudging the severity of what's happening here in Europe, and it's misjudging the stability of even the U.S. balance sheet. And in essentially what they are considering to be safe for liquidity purposes is anything but safe, and I think ultimately may be tested in terms of liquidity at some point in this cycle, whether that's 12 or 24 months out, we'll have to see. Well, David, we've talked a little bit about gold. We've talked a little bit about the dollar. But, you know, here lately we've seen interest in other currencies. And, you know, is there a distinction between one currency versus another? And when people are moving towards safety or liquidity, where do they go other than the dollar? Well, let's paint with a broad brushstroke and then get more specific. The broad analysis is that they're all fiat and and worth less and less every day that you own them because you've got Mm -hmm. people who are managing the value of those currencies, sometimes managing up, sometimes managing down. But over a long period of time, we've seen all fiats being managed to lower values. Having said that, painting with very specific and small breaststrokes, there are several resource currencies which have reasonable fundamentals, but they are at this point trading in line with the global recession expectations and the impact that that's likely to have on commodity demand. So, you know, a Canadian dollar, an Australian dollar, a New Zealand dollar, a Swedish kroner, a Russian ruble, a Brazilian real, all of these have had some play to the upside as a quote-unquote dollar alternative, quote-unquote inflation hedge, Uh, and and I use that very loosely, but, you know, just in the context of, of a dollar alternative, having an economy that is based on resources which seem to be doing very well over the last two, three, five years. That has been the analysis of those alternative resource currencies. They are suffering at present, and they're suffering because they are being lumped in together, again, as I described it, a global recession expectation. Things are slowing, and it appears that they're slowing not only with developed countries. The hope was that developing countries would be doing much better and that perhaps China would be a major contributor to growth in terms of global GDP. As it turns out, they've got their own issues, as we expected, as we expected many months ago. 
China has many, many issues to deal with, and they're now, they're now facing the same sort of recessionary pressures. Well, David, before we talk about China, which, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, they were being perceived as the bailout masters for Europe. I mean, you're in Europe right now. China doesn't seem to be there. China doesn't seem to be there ready to write a check. And you've likened this whole Greece situation and actually the Portugal, Italy, Spain, you know, you name it, the pig countries. You've likened this Eurozone and this crisis to the reactions of a manic depressive, you know, where one moment they're just absolutely exuberant and then the next moment they're completely depressed and suicidal. We've seen this just in the last couple of days. I mean, we, we saw people rushing to safety and liquidity like we talked about with the dollar. And now all of a sudden there's a rumor that there's a rumor that there's a rumor that maybe something's going to happen positive for Europe. Do you see the Eurozone solving the problem anytime soon? Kevin, there's no one here that has a clue. This is, I think, one of the failures of the news media is in portraying anyone in the EMU as having real leadership ability. Kevin, Mm. we're not talking about people with vast business experience. We're talking about petty socialist bureaucrats who have no idea what it takes to make decisions and take risk in the context of making decisions, even risk being wrong. The reputational risk, the professional risk, and all that comes with a simple decision-making process. Given the Eurozone estimates are now of about 2 trillion euros, which would be needed for sort of their shock and awe backstop to European banks, the European Mm. banks that are holding sovereign paper. So we've got Greek two-year notes trading at a 70% yield, and they're scrambling at present to make their October payments. After their October payments, you've got the next big hurdle, which is the December maturity, and they've got to come up with about 5.23 billion euros to pay off that debt. So, I mean, again, if they're able to dodge the October bullet, this is something like Russian roulette. There will be great relief, and there will be great celebration if they can come up with the October payment. The problem is, I mean, that's one chamber of six, And we're continuing to play this game of roulette here in Europe. The December maturity, again, they've got 5.23 billion euros coming due. They'll have to come up with those euros, too. Yeah, you know, you talk about it being one chamber of six, but there's a whole carton of ammunition afterwards that has to be refilled in there. I mean, it's just, it's completely unpayable. Now, there was an agreement on July 21st for private parties to share some of the risk in Europe. And it sounds like they're even second-guessing that at this point. Does that have to do with the credit default swaps? What was agreed on July 21st in Europe that right now is coming into question? Well, over the weekend, the G20 leaders were getting together and discussing the fact that this probably wasn't going to be a tolerable solution, and they'd have to put their minds together and come up with something better that was more palatable, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, should there be participation in losses in the event of a default? To what degree should there be a participation And this is where, Kevin, we're not out of the woods yet, because, again, it's not just a question of Eurozone, quote-unquote, leaders or bureaucrats. We're talking about an entire world which is full of people who have no idea what what it looks like to make critical decisions at critical points in time. They would rather get together as a committee and just, I don't know, mutually admire each other and feel important. This is really getting to the point of utter embarrassment wherein the people around the world who these G20 leaders represent should be up in arms saying, just make a simple decision, will you? Damn it, the world's getting ready to go to hell in a handbasket, and y'all are just sitting there patting each other in the back for really platitudes and nothing of substance. If you're going to do something, do something, even if it's the wrong thing, but don't tell us over and over and over and over again that we've agreed to create sort of a concerted effort and put our real shoulder into it this time. I mean, again, it, it really is. I think one of the things we're watching happen is the discrediting of this type of a leadership by committee. It just simply doesn't work. It doesn't work in Europe. It doesn't work anywhere in the world. Well, David, I think it's quite obvious that the IMF and the World Bank don't have enough money and probably never will have enough money to solve this problem. I mean, what do they have right now to throw at the problem, and then what are they asking for? Christine Lagarde has, has already said this week that they have $384 billion in cash to handle the bailouts and that that probably won't be sufficient. So they'll be looking for greater contributions from their members. And this is, I think, what is shocking is, I mean, we're talking about the U.S., we're talking about Britain, 
We're talking about some of the countries who themselves are having a hard time making ends meet. Sort of an interesting irony, the bailout of others when you can't pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. That's essentially why we look at this and say, this is not feasible. All we're doing is adding more layers of debt to pre-existing layers of debt and calling that good. This is why we were discussing with Hunter Lewis a few weeks ago the frailties of Keynesianism, because all they're assuming leadership both here in Europe and in the U.S. is if they buy time, that saner minds will return to the marketplace, that the consumer will begin consuming again, and we'll all go back to this peaceful, blissful utopia where no one saves and everyone spends and government's happier for it. Everyone focuses on getting their government cheese and living a day-by-day, paycheck-by-paycheck existence. It's the IMF, it's the World Bank. Certainly, they have reason to be concerned because they know that they're going to buzz through that $384 billion over the next 12 months without skipping a beat. Just a reminder, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Well, David, you know the saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. But in, in reality, these guys are just fooling and fooling and fooling and fooling. And, and the markets continue to react as if there's maybe going to be a solution. But this deleveraging has to occur, and these guys aren't willing to live with that. I think you're right, Kevin. That we will see a deflationary spat in here. The deleveraging which you describe is going to be selective to certain asset classes. And I don't see a general deleveraging across the board. I mean, certainly the consumer, and we pointed this out a few weeks ago, the consumer is working on deleveraging. They've gone from 130% of disposable income, debt to disposable income, to now 115%, with the mean number being closer to 75%. So certainly we will see the consumer continue to deleverage. I think you've already seen a good degree of deleveraging in corporate America. You look at balance sheets today, and balance sheets are healthier than they have been for some time. That doesn't mean that I would go out and and, and buy equities in general. Valuations are still very high and are unattractive from a fundamental standpoint, very unsupported by the market fundamentals. Um, But that will happen. The, The point is this, Kevin. You've got the IMF and the World Bank saying we need more money. You've got the Eurozone saying, well, we'll borrow from Peter to pay Paul. We'll steal from Peter to pay Paul. They have to come up with money out of nothing. This is the ex nihilo creation of fiat currency. This is where we would continue to argue there is an inflationary, from a monetary standpoint, an inflationary impact. There is a downgrade to every currency with every country who is not willing to tighten their belts, who is not willing to implement fiscal austerity measures, who can't get that done, who can't do that in the context of a voting public, a democracy, which won't allow for it, and is thus forced to inflate and inflate and inflate and inflate. We're not talking about the kind of inflation that would necessarily be positive to all commodities, but one that is very negative to the value of the currency, and one that we think is one of the good reasons for continuing to own gold at this point and and into the future. Well, you know, you talked about not buying equities, but gold shares are extremely cheap right now, they seem. They've come down, they've they've made some correction here. What's your thought on buying gold shares at this point? Well, Kevin, I think with a two- to three-year view, they are very cheap. And I think that we're likely to see them as the new dividend players. If, if you move yeah. out over the next three to five years, I think they're likely to be significant income generators. The volatility is painful. They're attached to the metals market in a very volatile way. And I would just note that, uh, you know, a company like Newmont has been very stable through the last week's correction relative to its peers in light of its dividend policy, increasing its dividends and obligating an increase of dividends with with the incremental growth in the the price of gold. So, I mean, with $2,500 gold, you're talking about a company that would be paying over 7% in its dividend. And that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, you think about putting money in the bank right now, and maybe you get 1%, maybe you get 2%, but you're talking about actually having a 7% payout. You know, this this reminds me of what gold shares used to be known for back in the 70s. They were huge dividend generators. A person could actually live on income just by owning their gold shares. That seemed to go away for years, but it, it looks like we have the return of the dividend payoff in the gold share market. 
in what is modest 2% today, I think will grow, Kevin, as, as they continue to pay out more and more and on a reasonable cost basis. I think that'll be a huge benefit to investors. So yes, I think they're cheap. I think they're as cheap as they were, just about as cheap as they were in 2000, just about as cheap as they were in 2008. You could say that this is probably the third cheapest they've been in a decade, and I would have to take a strong look at those. And you know, Kevin, this is this is one of the reasons why, as as as, as a company, we prize the availability of cash. We we have stubbornly kept cash in our managed accounts between 30 and 50 percent. Right. And so the volatility which we've seen of late not only does it not hurt us, but with this break in prices to lower levels, for us it's a very happy affair. We look at pricing and say, this is fantastic. I mean, the profits that were generated between 2008 and 2011 were in large part because of the liquidity variable and the ability to put money to work for you at an opportune time. So what appears to be a non-investment is absolutely one of the most critical investments that you can make. And it's, it's simply having liquidity when it counts most. And that's what this last week has been about. We've, we've really enjoyed it. Well, Dave, I think about all those hedge funds last week that we talked about that were almost fully invested that had to just do whatever they could, sell gold or or whatever, just to generate a little bit of cash. But I think about McIlvaney Wealth Management, the fund was very flexible because of this 30 to 50% cash position. It allowed you not to have to liquidate when everybody else was and go in and buy after everyone had liquidated. That, isn't that the, the primary goal of being ready to invest on the dip? Yeah, Kevin, I, and I think this is where I, the whole philosophy at most hedge funds is just so aggressive. I mean, when you're playing with other people's money, and that's exactly what they're doing, is they're playing a game and they're playing as fast and as loose as they can so that they can retire when they're 28 or 32 or, or, or some stupid number like that. And they're invested not 100% where they would have zero cash. They're invested to the tune of 110, 120, 130%. So they have leveraged portfolios with no liquidity at all. If there's a hiccup in any way, shape, or form, you've got forced liquidations. And it's a very... It's a very speculative way to live and invest, and in this market, a very speculative way to die. A lot of hedge funds have been crucified over the last year and a half, two years. You know, our management style is very different. We've been able to make money through 2008, 9, 10. Uh, we're doing quite well this year. Even with the volatility of the last week or so, we're not in a position where our hands are tied. In fact, we're able to allocate assets very, very effectively in here. And so the hedge funds that are liquidating gold today to book profits and to have something to show their investors to justify their existence, that we're just not in the same position where forced liquidations are the measure of the day because someone outside of the firm, like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, you know, changing the rules and having to get in compliance. We just have a safer margin for that kind of volatility and are very comfortable with the kind of cash positions we've been acquiring. When I was at the Bloomberg studio there in London this last week, they were asking me some sort of pre-questions and saying, you know, hey, listen, the, we've talked to a lot of fund managers and, and it seems like they've wanted to increase their cash to, you know, 5 and 6% up from, you know, 2 and 3%. And I just kind of shook my head and I said, yeah, but we're at right. 30 to 50% already. I mean, I guess they don't really understand what's happening. 3 to 5% is not enough to get anything done. Again, unless you're going back to that 110 or 120 percent invested in a fully leveraged portfolio. Well, and David, that brings us up to a point, though. All right, you have the luxury sometimes to stay in 30 to 50 percent because you've had commodities, you know, rising. And when we think of the triangle, part of the triangle rises when the other part sometimes just sits liquid. That's we've talked about a third in gold, a third in growth types of assets, and a third in cash. But you know, for the person who's retired, I'm just thinking about my mom my grandma, she's 92 years old. When she was building up her asset base to live off of, she was assuming that she was going to get a little bit of interest. But you've talked about financial repression, that the government, you know, what was announced last week by the Federal Reserve was just one more example, I think, of financial repression. They're basically saying, look, if you thought interest rates were going to rise, we're going to see to it, even artificially, even with your money that interest rates don't rise. Is this something new, this financial repression, or have we seen stints of this in the past, and is there an end? We've seen it in the past, Kevin, but never to this degree. And I guess, you know, to define what we're talking about, the current environment, 2007 to 2009, we've had zero interest rates for the last 33 months. And the commitment from the Fed is to continue that forward for at least another 24 months. 
And the reason why we call it repression, Kevin, is because it's taking the interest rate and pushing it below a natural level. It's a suppression of this form, which has never been done on this grand of a scale, uh, but it has been done before. I mean, if you go back to the early 2000s, the Fed dropped interest rates to 1% for about 12 months, and it was very right. stimulative to the economy. And that's what they're trying to do is stimulate consumer activity in business borrowing and whatnot, borrowing and spending. Of course, rates were manipulated lower in an earlier period of time. If you go back to the 1989 to 91 period, it was just a different interest rate environment then. So rates were lowered significantly to what were very low levels then at 3%, and they kept them there for about 17 months. And Kevin, I guess if you want to look at financial repression this way, imagine a Keynesian with an imaginary gun in his hand going to your grandmother and saying, you will spend every last dime or we will punish you for it and punishment comes in the form of non-payment of interest. Right. So essentially it is the Keynesian gun in hand saying, we're not going to pay you one lead cent, therefore you get out there and spend. You do your job. According to the Keynesian model, that's what every person is supposed to do. And that's contrary to what you just described, Kevin, where your mother, your grandmother may have put that away for a rainy day and need that interest income just to live on, just to pay bills, never wanting to dip into principal because it gives them that insecurity of feeling like, well, what if I end up in ramen noodles or Vienna sausages in my latter years and that's all I've got? I don't want to starve. I don't want to be out in the rain. I want to be able to take care of myself. That's why I forewent those present pleasures for some future reward, and now that reward is being taken from them. So I think that it's the right description, Kevin, financial repression, and I think that's something that the average investor, whether they know it or not, it is being done to them, not for them. And a low interest rate environment certainly helps certain financial players in terms of being able to borrow at very cheap rates and speculate. And that's actually a part of the reason why we've seen the dollar do what it's been doing here recently with this sort of operation twist from the Fed, you have something of an unwind of the carry trade. And as as short dated paper is moving the opposite direction, and as the dollar is appreciating, you're having these leveraged players have to pay back the dollar dollars that they've borrowed as they're watching their margins, profit margins get squeezed. Well, David, the carry trade is sort of a complex thought process. It's something that we saw with Japan, you know, a, a decade ago, and, and now we're seeing the carry trade here. Without going into great complexity, maybe that's something that we could spend a show covering down the road. Would you be willing to explain that in a little bit more detail later? Oh, sure, because it certainly is a dynamic that's fueled speculation and creates instability in the marketplace, and that's something that should be well understood. Yeah, and in the meantime, I think one of the questions that needs to be addressed that I'm seeing our listeners come up with is the Dow has just been stuck in this range for, it seems, forever, really, Dave. I look back 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when the stock market was at 12,000 points, And here we are in the ten to 11,000 range, and it just wanders around. How long are we going to be range-bound in the Dow? Well, Kevin, there's some dynamics that are changing in the marketplace that are are frankly very unhealthy, you know, because while the Dow is range-bound, you've got investors who are pulling funds because they're just reaching that state of demoralization, and they don't want to do this again. And so we've seen upwards of $375 billion in withdrawals from equity mutual funds, Kevin. And in the place, I mean, the the reason why we've described in the past the stock market as something of a ghost town is because high-frequency trading has taken the place of the general equity investor. And high-frequency trading today accounts for over 75, almost 80% of all volumes on the New York Stock Exchange. If you're looking at the the dollar values involved in sort of this churning process by high-frequency traders, you're talking about $66 trillion, which is being turned over annually in the stock market to generate you know, somewhere between 5 and $10 billion in profits. And on a percentage basis, that's just nothing. It's absolutely nothing. And, and right. what's interesting is, is that you know, we, we've basically eliminated the average investor from the marketplace. They're now playing for pennies, and trends and long-term issues really don't matter to the high-frequency traders. So the pricing mechanism within the stock market, I think, is fairly inaccurate. Just as we've seen suppression in the interest rate market and bonds, the U.S. Treasury market does not today reflect 
the solvency risk associated with the U.S. balance sheet. We, too, look at the stock market and say things are not reflective of value. And, and what you see in terms of price is really a misrepresentation. A lot of that has been confused starting about six years ago. You have in 2003, 2004, we've seen a tripling of volume, a tripling of volume on the New York Stock Exchange, and we've been range-bound. Obviously, there's different elements that go into sort of the historical appraisal of this, but the Dow has been range-bound before. It was between 1966 and 1982. And it, like this period today, that 66 to 82 period, and where we're at today, was also a period of negative real rates. When companies are cheap, when yields are considerably positive, when inflation is falling, then you have an environment where markets can recover, where companies can prosper, where business cycles can resume an uptrend. And frankly, in that environment, the need to own gold becomes less important. And that's not the environment we're in. We're still in that sort of range-bound 1966 to 1982, not a bear market where it's catastrophic all of the 1930s, but you just get ground down and you, you can't handle it anymore because it's just so cotton pick and boring. Well, David, the positive on that, I mean, that's the glass half empty portion. And yes, the Dow that's range bound does seem like the glass is not only half empty, but even more. But the glass half full portion of that 1966 to 1982 period of time was gold went from a ratio of 30 ounces of gold equaling one share of the Dow to one to one during that period of time. So the person who owned gold, you were talking about that's when the need to own gold occurs. There are great gains in other areas when the Dow is range bound. And, and I'm thinking of this time period that we're at, at now. We've been range bound for 10 years, but gold has gone from about 42 ounces to one on the Dow to where we are now, which is in the in the six to seven ounce range, probably on the way to one to one, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and the real gain that you're describing, Kevin, is in purchasing power of real assets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what becomes very compelling. As more and more people exit the market, I mean, I mentioned $375 billion being taken out in equity mutual funds. Kevin, this is a sign of the times. This is what's involved in the slow bleeding process where ultimately we will see a period of capitulation and price shock to the downside on the Dow. And we will see the market so bombed out and the general public so uninterested in equities that you'll still be looking at companies like Johnson & Johnson and Bristol-Myers Squibb and Caterpillar and Illinois Tool Works and Heinz Company. And these are companies that still are going to be selling soup and ketchup and Band-Aids and Yellow Iron. I mean, they're still in business and they're still moving products all over the world and they're still making money and they should be owned intelligently and they are owned particularly intelligently when you can buy them just for pennies on the dollar. It's what's developing, Kevin. I think if there's anything encouraging to me in the context of a fairly, frankly, a fairly dark period in time, it's that these are the necessary steps. These are the necessary events that get us to the point of compelling value. And we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. And, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss in not mentioning China in today's program, Kevin, because this is an area where I do not see compelling value, have not seen compelling value, and don't see right. stimulus as effective for long-term growth at this point. Move out 20 years from now, and I think you and I would both be China bulls. But over the next 20 months, probably more China bears, the only exception to that being if, if the government's going to spend literally trillions of dollars in a very short period of time. And then just like a small child on a candy bar, you're talking about spastic behavior. I guess if you want to view that as positive, you can, but it's certainly not lifeless. That's not really a growth story, in my opinion. I want to see something organic and fundamental before I'm shelling out hard-earned dollars to risk in capital markets that today are too opaque to, to be investing in with serious money. Yeah, David, I know we joke about your dad saying that China is the, the next thing, and I, I think he would admit, too, that you know there, a little time needs to pass. 
you feel more time needs to pass, I think, than he does. But you know, just think about Mercedes saying that growth in luxury vehicle sales has really slowed through the summer months up to present time in China. The Chinese economy seems to be slowing. The excess funds that seem to be just so readily available seem to be tightening up a little bit. David, in the face of maybe, what, 14 15% inflation in China right now? So if you have a contraction, maybe this is more of an inflationary contraction. It is, and, you know, I mean, their official inflation rate's closer to 6 6.5%, but, you know, they've tortured their statistics like they've tortured a lot of other things. Right. And, you know, they can make them sing. So 15 16% is a real-world number, with 6 being the reported Kevin, you know, Fitch, it was in the in the spring of this year that Fitch said they expected 30% of the bank loans in China to be non-performing. Hmm. Now that we're seeing a slowdown in China with the Purchasing Managers Index under 50, Kevin, I, th- I think what you're likely to see is a lot of real estate developers go to the wall, and that's a 12, 18-month period of time, going scramble for borrowing abilities in lines of credit. But, you know, borrowing another trillion-dollar stimulus, you're going to see major hiccups in the banking arena in China for over the next 18 months. Would you say that's the case for the emerging markets as well, David? Well, it's interesting, Kevin. I mean, this idea of decoupling was and is a fool's errand, in my opinion. The emerging markets are far more dramatically impacted than the developed world markets. You could say that future growth is going to be predicated on the developing world, not the developed world. And if you look at Western Europe, if you look at America, that we've seen our growth cycle and you're likely to see better Mm -hmm. growth elsewhere. But that doesn't mean that that's going to be tomorrow. It doesn't mean that they're on a platform to do that at present. You know, remember, it was England that was an emerging market, you know, when Italy was the banking center. And it was America that was the emerging market when England was the banking center. And yes, China and many of these emerging markets are likely to be very successful, including Brazil, as we sort of pass the baton. But these are things that don't happen very quickly and not usually on a voluntary basis. The U.S. doesn't want to give up its preeminence on the world financial scene. That's something that's usually ripped from it. Uh, you know, the, the, just as the British didn't voluntarily give it away, it was taken from them through multiple world wars and, and true bankruptcy. But, Kevin, the risks are there. You've, you've got the currencies in many of these developing countries which are under pressure. And as you know, trade is the predicate for growth in the emerging world. And in when world trade slows, so does the cash flow to these little outposts. And, you know, I mean, we're not talking all little outposts. Brazil's a giant. But the Brazilian sure. real, their currency is off 16% in less than a month, Kevin. 16% mm. in less than a month. And as commodity prices are under pressure, that, that trend will, will stay down. Well, what about Asian currencies? You talked about the South American currencies, but the Asian currencies, are they as volatile? Oh, well, they saw their worst week last week since 1998, Kevin, and what was then the Asian flu. Different dynamics today than there were then, but you're seeing weakness in in the currency markets the world over. Uh, And I'd like to say that that there was, you know, a a better story to tell even in our, our own economy, Kevin, but new home sales are down. We've got prices dropping from last year by about 7.7% from 2010 numbers to today. It only costs you 125 ounces to buy the average single family home, whereas we were between five and 600 ounces at the peak. So David, what you're talking about is 125 ounces of gold would buy a home right now, which is really about one fifth of what it was just a few years ago. That's right. And, you know, we may ultimately see that target at 100 ounces at 50, maybe even 25 in select areas where, again, when we were talking about equities a moment ago, and certainly real estate is in the same camp, we're talking about an increase in purchasing power. When I look at gold, I don't look at it as a growth asset. I look at it as the ability to preserve value, to ensure that you protect and preserve wealth through a period of extreme financial contraction and then be able to redeploy assets when those other productive assets are selling at a discount. So it serves a function, Kevin. It serves a function like a lifeboat, like a life raft, like a life vest. You're not talking about winning fashion shows. You're not talking about pleasure cruises. You're just talking about something that is highly functional in a dysfunctional world. And and that's why I look at where we started our conversation today, Kevin, and say, is the world any more functional today than it was two weeks ago, two months ago, or two years ago. And I think we both agree it's far more dysfunctional. That's why I I think that role of insurance is, is ever more important. And it's going to dawn on more and more people around the world 
that that's what they need. Not gold as a speculative investment, not silver as a growth play, but money. Money which has been a form of wealth for 5,000 years and has stood the test of time. Whereas every other asset class has been through the ringer to one degree or another, and is at different times because of liquidity concerns or solvency concerns or the combination of the two been priced at zero. And that's just never been the case with gold. So that's where we're at, Kevin. The rising price of gold represents failing trust in fiat currencies. And I can tell you, having spent some time in Brussels, we're here today. I've never been more scared in my life. Brussels, as as the belly of the beast and in the EU, I hope next week I can have a, a better comment for you on Europe. We'll be talking to some folks that spend their life here, the 15 different analysts from around Europe who compare notes and part of a think tank will be participating in two days of of meetings with them this next week. And perhaps they can change my view on this, but it appears to me that that the grand social experiment here in Europe and something that, that could have been a test case for the world is in the process of failing. So, David, going back to the beginning of the program when we asked, have the fundamentals changed? You know, for the listener who's been listening for the last couple of two or three, four years, and they do have a position in physical gold and silver, and they do have a position put aside maybe for growth and some cash, would you say with the volatility that we saw over the last few days, the drop in the gold price and the silver price, is there something that they should be doing different, or is this the time to hold tight and maybe even add more? I wouldn't change a thing, Kevin. I wouldn't change a thing. I would pick some particular prices to come into the market and add if if that is your prerogative. Um, But the fundamentals, if they have changed, have just gotten stronger. That would be my only point, is if they have changed at all, they've simply gotten stronger. The argument for owning gold in particular, Kevin, has never been more compelling. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney in Brussels, Belgium right now. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.